All right, this video is on the uh, CWI exam again. I already did a couple. This is gonna be my last one. Then we're gonna get back to doing some welding stuff. But um, there was a couple things that I forgot to mention on the first video, and after I saw my itemized results list, when it, which is a list they give you, the AWS sends you of what was on your exam when you took it. And I'll take I'll take another shot of that actual list, and you can see how many questions were on each um, category, whether it be qualification or pre-qualification or fabrication. Um, it's a good little sheet. It's going to show you exactly what I had on my test when I took it. Uh, some of the things that I forgot to mention were skewed T-joints, uh, and I'll do a shot of the skewed T-joint section of the D11 as well, the face reinforcements, and again, I'll do another shot of that, and then responsibilities of uh, contractor, uh, engineer, inspector, people that are on a job site. So we'll cut to those other shots and hopefully learn something from it. All right, this is the first section we have on here on uh, skewed T-joints with fillet welds. It's in section 2.3.5.2 on page 6 of the Structural Steel D1.1 welding code. And you can see right there, the main thing I've highlighted, the shop drawings shall show the detailed arrangement of welds and required leg size to account for the effects of joint geometry. And it kind of goes into where appropriate the Z loss reduction. So basically, it's just telling you that in order to be a skewed T joint, the angle has to be um, below 80 degrees and above 100 degrees. If you're in between 80 and 100, that's considered not a skewed T joint. We'll head on to the next section here. This is the section that has the most information on skewed T joints. It's the next page, page 7. It's 2.4.3 uh, and it says uh, skewed T joints. And in the general, it says T joints in which the angle between joint parts is greater than 100 or less than 80 shall be considered a skewed T joint. You scroll down a little bit. Welds in acute angles between 80 and 60 and in obtuse angles greater than 100. And you can see it says the contract documents shall specify the required effective throat. Also placement of welds and the required and the required leg dimensions to, to be satisfied the required uh, effective throat you have to see annex B for the test you probably won't have that on there because they don't have much on the annexes. Then it goes angles between 60 and 30. And you can see there it says the effective thro throat shall be increased by the Z loss allowance on table 2.2. We're going to look at that in a minute and kind of show you what Z loss is. And then welds in angles less than 30 degrees. Welds deposited in acute angles less than 30 degrees shall not be considered as effective in transmitting applied forces except for the modified tubular structures. So basically when you get less than 30 it's considered too sharp of an angle and then it's, not, it's no good. Then your effective length of the skewed T-joint and it says it shall be the overall length of the full size of the weld. It's pretty basic so it's just the length of the, the weld. And it continues on to the next page, page 8. We'll go to that now. Alright, now we're um, on page 8, the effective throat of skewed T-joints. And if it's between 60 and 30 degrees, it shall be the minimum distance from the root to the diagram diagrammatic face, less the Z-loss reduction dimension. And we're going to look at that Z-loss again here in a second. You can also see it's going back to the uh, 80 and 60 and then greater than 100 shall be taken from the shortest distance from the root or the joint root to the weld face. So that's going to give you your effective throat. Then your effective area is very simple. It's just your effect, effective throat multiplied by the effective length, which was just the length of the weld. So now we're going to go look at our uh, tables and figures here. And you can see here, 
and you can see here it's page 24 table 2.2 this is going to give you your Z loss dimensions for non tubular so it's just plate and you can see it's got uh, metric as well as standard and you can see here there is your degrees versus your process and there's your Z loss that first section is if you're doing vertical or overhead and then the next section on the table is going to be horizontal and flat and there's your Z losses now we'll go to the uh, figure of the skewed T-joint and show you what a Z loss is Okay, this is page 124, figure 3.11. And this is your pre-qualified skewed T-joint details, non-tubular, of course. And you can see, if you look right here, whoop, if you look right here, that Z right there, there's your Z loss. So it's going to assume that your angle is too tight to get in to the very base of the root and that's what's considered a z-loss that's what those numbers mean we'll get back out here and you can see there's your pre-qualified skew t-joints and that's pretty much what you need to know about skewed t-joints know that stuff it's going to be on there we're going to move on to our next section here now we just finished up our skewed t-joint section now we're going to move into our responsibilities we're going to start on page one of the D11 it's going to start right out with the engineer at the bottom of the page 1.3.1 the engineer is uh, defined as the duly designated individual who acts for and in behalf of the owner basically the engineer is the second in command now we're going to turn the page and get on to the rest of the responsibilities. Now we're now on page two. We're at the contractor. The contractor shall be defined as any company or that individual representing a company responsible for the fabrication, erection, manufacturing, or welding in conformance with the provisions of this code. And I kind of highlighted the important stuff in this for each um, person's responsibility. Now we're into inspectors, the contractor's inspector, and the contractor inspector acts in behalf of the contractor on all inspection and quality matters within the scope of the code and the contract documents. And you go down and you got the verification inspector, acts in behalf of the owner or engineer on all inspection and quality matters specified by the engineer. An unmodified inspector is basically just an inspector. It doesn't have any other kind of title. And they operate within the limits of responsibilities described in 6.1.2, which we'll hit here in a minute. Now we scroll down to uh, the bottom of the page on page 2, and it goes over responsibilities. It's going to start with the engineer's responsibilities. And then if we come up to the top of the page, it's going to give a number of responsibilities of the engineer. You can see there's quite a few. Then it's going to get into the contractor's responsibilities and then the number of inspection people which is going to start with the contractor inspection, the verification inspection, and now we're going to go to the section that was 6.1.2 and there's a whole other section of responsibilities now here we are at 6.1.2 and it's the very beginning of the uh, inspection section on page 219 and it's going to go over further responsibilities Right, this is going to go over further responsibility. So if you can't find the answer to a question in the first section, go to section 6 
and you can see it's going to go over inspection and contract stipulations, contra contractor's inspection, and there's going to be more information on it, verification inspection, and then you're going to go over definition of inspector categories, which this is going to be on your test. Contractor's inspector. The inspector is the duly designated person who acts for and in behalf of the we're going to go up here to the top the contractor on all inspections and quality matters within the scope of the contract documents then it's going to go over your verification inspector the inspector is the duly designated person who acts for and in behalf of the owner or engineer on all inspection and quality matters within the scope of the contract documents and then the last one is just your inspector or inspectors and it's um, without further qualification as to the specific inspector category described above it applies equally to inspection and verification within the limits of the res of responsibility described in 612 which we already kind of looked at basically reverts back to the very beginning over here inspection and contract stipulations and that just says for the purpose of this code fabrication erection inspection and testing and verification inspection and testing shall be separate functions and that was the same uh, section that it was referred to in uh, the first section in the general hopefully that makes sense but that's where you can locate all the information for responsibilities in the D1.1 all right, now we're going to look at um, groove weld reinforcement, and you can see it's in 5.24.3 groove welds. And that's on page 205, and it says that groove weld reinforcement shall comply with table 5.9 and 5.10. The provisions below basically just saying that welds shall have gradual transition to the plane of the base metal surfaces. So let's uh, fast forward to these tables and take a look at them. All right, here we are at table 5.9, 5 5.10 is right below it on page 2.10. 5.9 is basically going to refer you to figures to see weld profiles. You really don't need to know that. We need to go to 5.10. And you can see 5.10 is weld profile schedules. And you can see right here, they're in different schedules. Schedule A, less than or greater than one inch. The reinforcement minimum is zero all the way down for the thicknesses. And the reinforcement max is listed right to the right of that. That's going to be eighth of an inch, three sixteenths in your quarter. You can see I highlighted it. Now schedule B is a little bit different. It goes to a C max or a C min. And that means convexity or concavity your C max is your convexity and you can see that if it's less than an inch thick it's an eighth of an inch if it's greater than or equal to an inch it's up to three sixteenths if you go down to schedule C it's less than or equal to five sixteenths it's going to be a sixteenth of an inch if it's greater than 5 sixteenths but less than an inch, it's going to be an eighth. And if it's greater than or equal to an inch, it's going to be 3 sixteenths. But of course, you see that C max has a little B next to it, which means it's going to have a footnote. And all it says for B is C shall not exceed R. Those are your basic reinforcements. Schedule D is something a little weird. You're probably not going to see that. So basically what you need to know is where to find your Schedule A, your Schedule B, and your Schedule C. And that's going to give you your reinforcements. Alright, lastly, this is the itemized results for the test I took. And it's going to give you the number of questions for each section. 
this is probably a very important part if you're looking to study for this exam. Part A is fundamentals. And you can see weld examination, there was 15 questions. Welding performance, there was 15 questions. Testing methods, non-destructive, there was 14 questions. Safety, there was 8. Welding processes, there was 16. Brazing, there was 3. Definitions and terminology, there was 19. Heat control and metallurgy, there was 11. Symbols, welding, and non-destructive testing, there was 17. Duties and responsibilities, there was 8. Destructive testing, there was 7. Reports and records, there was 10. Soldering, there was 2. Cutting, there was 5 for a grand total of 150. Now the practical. Procedures and welder qualification, there was 14. Welding inspection and flaws, there was 18. Utilization of specifications and drawings, there was 5. Non-destructive tests, there was 5. Mechanical tests and properties, there was 4 for a grand total of 46. And now you're into your code part. Inspection, 15. Fabrication, 15. Qualification of skewed T-joints, there was 2. Qualification, there was 13. Material and design, skewed T-joints, there was 2. Material and design, there was 3 for a grand total of 50. Hopefully all that made sense. If you have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the comments. And uh, thanks for watching and subscribing to TV Weld. Good luck on your test.